Hello, uh, welcome to this session, Integrating TBS into Clinical Practice. I'm Shelley Horn, uh, and I'll be uh, introducing uh, this session. Professor Didier Hans will be joining us to moderate the Q&A session at the end. We'll be accepting questions throughout the presentation to be answered live at the conclusion of the presentation as time permits. You may type your questions into the Q&A on the right-hand side of your screen. We do ask that you keep these questions specific to this presentation. I'd like now to introduce our speakers for this presentation. We have two world-renowned experts in osteoporosis joining us today, and we're delighted to introduce you to both Dr. Mike Lewecki and Dr. Andrea Singer. Dr. Lewecki is Director of New Mexico Clinical Research and Osteoporosis Center and Director of Bone Health Teleecho at University of New Mexico Health Sciences Center in Albuquerque. He's a consultant in osteoporosis and metabolic bone disease, supervisor and interpreter of bone density studies, and an educator with a special interest in the evaluation and treatment of osteoporosis and metabolic bone diseases. He has been principal investigators for many osteoporosis clinical trials and is author of over 300 publications in peer-reviewed um, medical journals, as well as books, book chapters, and online publications on osteoporosis. Dr. Wecky, Dr. Lewecki is past president of the ICD and current president of the Osteoporosis Foundation of New Mexico. He is an editor for Osteoporosis International and is on the editorial boards of the Journal of Bone and Mineral Research and the Journal of Clinical Densitometry. He has received national and international awards that include the 2021 Dr. John Belzikian ISED Global Leadership Award and the 2021 Lawrence Rice Memorial Lecture Award with the Bone Health and Osteoporosis Foundation. Dr. Lewecki is also the program director of the annual Santa Fe Bone Symposium. Uh, Dr. Singer is director of Women's Primary Care, director of the Bone Densitometry Program and medical director of the Fracture Liaison Service focusing on secondary fracture perfection at MedStar Georgetown University Hospital in Washington, DC. She holds a dual appointment at the Departments of Medicine and Optetrics and Gynecology at Georgetown University Medical Center in Washington, DC. Dr. Singer is Chief Medical Officer at the Bone Health and Osteoporosis Foundation, which is formerly the National Osteoporosis Foundation, and has been a member of the Board of Trustees. She co-chairs the annual interdisciplinary symposium on osteoporosis for the BHOF. Dr. Singer has been the principal investigator for several clinical trials and quality improvement projects in osteoporosis and bone health. She has authored numerous publications in peer-reviewed journals, including the Mayo Clinic Proceedings, Osteoporosis International, Journal of Bone and Mineral Research, Current Medical Research Opinion, and Joan of Burnham and Joint Surgery, among others, as well as book chapters and online publications. She is section editor of Bone Health in Journal of Women's Health, a member of the Editorial Board of Osteoporosis, Clinical Updates, and Reviewer for Osteoporosis International, American Journal of Obstetrics and Gynecology, and Journal of Sexual Medicine. Uh, thank you um, for your time, and uh, welcome Dr. Lewecki and Dr. Singer. It's a pleasure to be here today with my friend and esteemed colleague, Dr. Michael Lewicki, to talk about integrating TBS into clinical practice. This is the overview of what we are going to discuss uh, in the next brief time together. And I'll start by talking about clinical benefits. Um, to level set, I'd like to just refresh a definition of osteoporosis because this becomes important in terms of our discussion today. As you well know, this is a systemic skeletal disease characterized by low bone mass and microarchitectural deterioration of bone tissue, which ultimately leads to fracture. They say a picture is worth a thousand words, and I think looking at the difference between normal bone and osteoporotic bone shows us it's not just the amount of bone that changes, but it's really a deterioration in terms of the trabecular connections and increase in porosity. We'll talk about this more as we go through, um, but the importance of this is in part that historically we've not had a non-invasive tool to help us measure or assess bone microarchitecture. We know that bone mineral density is a very important factor 
and that as you can see from this data from the NORA trial, looking at the blue bar graphs, which look at uh, the fractures, fracture increases as bone mineral density decreases as we go to the right of, on the x-axis. What's important to keep in mind though, is that if we look at the greatest number of women who have fractures, they fall into the low bone mass or osteopenic range. Indeed, they don't occur in those who have T-scores better than minus 2.5. So bone mineral density is a very important piece of the equation, but it is not the only thing for us to consider. This leads us to think about the concept of reaching beyond bone mineral density. I think what's really important is that we think about bone strength. And bone strength is made up of a combination of the amount of bone that's there or bone quantity, which can be measured by a number of different technologies, which are listed here on the slide. But it is also made up of underlying bone quality, which incorporates turnover, bone mineralization, the geometry of bone, and importantly, gets us back to this concept of bone microarchitecture. Again, how are we going to non-invasively assess that? And this is really where trabecular bone score comes in. So trabecular bone score, or TBS, is an FDA cleared software that can be installed on a DEXA system, and it helps to estimate bone texture from a PA DEXA scan, PA spine DEXA scan. TBS is associated with bone microarchitecture, and importantly, it provides risk information that's independent of and additive to bone mineral density and clinical risk factors. On the left-hand side of the slide, you see two standard spine DEXA images. Now, both of these patients have the same bone mineral density and identical T-scores. But look what happens when we apply TBS. You can see that they have different microarchitecture. Uh, the patient on top has a good microarchitecture and a TBS score that is in the normal range. The patient on the bottom of the slide has poor microarchitecture, increased porosity, a decreased trabecular connections, and a degraded TBS score. So this is a way to differentiate patients who look the same by bone mineral density, um, but again, have different underlying bone quality, perhaps. TBS has been validated uh, in many different studies. There are more than 850 publications, number of peer-reviewed publications, and it's now mentioned in more than 20 different guidelines across the world. As I already mentioned, TBS is a predictor of fracture risk that's independent of bone mineral density and clinical risk factors. And the idea is that it enhances fracture risk assessment and may indeed aid in treatment decisions Mike will talk a little bit more about this and we'll discuss this when we look at some clinical cases, but may be particularly useful in situations in which there is clinical uncertainty. That patient with low bone mass where we're trying to decide what to do, situations in certain clinical diseases where fracture risk is disproportionate to bone mineral density, specifically type two diabetes, patient who's been treated with glucocorticoids, primary hyperparathyroidism, and as we'll talk about later, the patient who has normal bone density by DEXA, uh, but sustains a fracture. Osteoarthritis, which we know can complicate our interpretation of bone mineral density, and when fracture risk as assessed by FRAX is close to intervention thresholds. Mike will also talk in a few moments about how changes in TBS may be useful in terms of monitoring. This is a slide that you are used to seeing in terms of looking at associations between fracture risk and bone mineral density. But if we now in, add in TBS, you can see that this again enhances assessment of risk. So look at the bar uh, that is in the deepest red color. These are patients who have osteoporosis by T-score and are in the lowest tertile or the degraded range for TBS. Those patients clearly have the highest rates of incident fracture. So again, combining this, these different pieces of information may give us a better way to assess fracture risk. 
Many of us are using FRAX in clinical practice. Indeed, many of our reports incorporate and print out FRAX risk scores. Let's take a look at how, if we add TBS adjustment, we can see a difference in terms of fracture risk. So for this patient who's 65 years, and you can see the different um, risk factors that are checked off, somebody who's treated with glucocorticoids, patient has a major osteoporotic 10-year risk of fracture of 16%, hip fracture of 3%. We can adjust with a TBS score. And when we do that now, major osteoporotic fracture risk is 21%, hip fracture 4.4%. So adjustments can go up or down and may help us, particularly for patients who are near that fracture threshold uh, and intervention threshold. TBS is particularly useful, as I have just alluded to, when patients are close to an intervention threshold. And this was a study that was done looking at um, changes in classification. What was seen in this study is that there was a small but significant improvement in major osteoporotic fracture and hip fracture risk assessment when TBS was added. Um, it was greatest in younger patients under the age of 65, and more than 90% of that reclassification was found in patients who were near the intervention threshold. So again, something that may be clinically useful for us when we are trying to determine approach to treatment. And finally, we know that degenerative disease can influence bone mineral density and our interpretation of T-scores, particularly at the spine as patients age. Um, bone mineral density declines with increasing age but at the spine can be seen to increase in this study after the age of 63, often because of either degenerative disease or the presence of vertebral fractures. But TBS in this study continued to decline. So that in situations where we have difficulty interpreting the spine, um, TBS may be an added piece of information that can still help us assess whether somebody's microarchitecture is degraded, normal, uh, or partially degraded. At this point, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Lewicki to continue with the rest of the presentation. Thank you, Andrea. Uh, since this is an ISCD meeting, I think it's important to consider the ISCD official positions, uh, which uh, have been developed from consideration of TBS in uh, two different uh, position development conferences. Uh, the ISCD official positions state that TBS is associated with vertebral, hip, and major osteoporotic fracture risk in postmenopausal women, with hip and major osteoporotic fracture risk in men over age 50 years, and major osteoporotic fracture risk in postmenopausal women with type 2 diabetes. TBS can be used with FRAX to adjust fracture probability in postmenopausal women and older men. And ISCD goes on to say TBS should not be used alone for uh, determining treatment recommendations. TBS uh, may also have a role in monitoring. Uh, this was considered in the most recent position development conference with the finding that the role of TBS in monitoring anti-resorptive therapy is unclear uh, with the best uh, evidence for a possible role established with uh, denosumab. TBS is potentially useful for monitoring anabolic therapy. And we'll talk about that in more detail in just a minute. If you do choose to use TBS for monitoring, it is important to uh, do precision assessment and calculate least significant change uh, using exactly the same sort of protocols that we use uh, for DEXA. And without knowing your LSC for TBS, you can't really determine uh, whether a change is statistically significant or not. A statistically significant change in TBS uh, may provide useful information in some situations in addition uh, to bone mineral density uh, and or the use of bone turnover markers. Uh, 
And here are some ways that you might uh, think of using uh, TBS. Uh, if you look at situations where there's been a significant decrease in TBS and a patient is not on treatment, uh, then this is consistent with increasing fracture risk and probably cause for clinical concern. If TBS decreases on a treated patient, that suggests suboptimal response to therapy and might lead us to consider evaluation for poor compliance or underlying or contributing factors that uh, uh, are causing this change. Uh, what about an increase in TBS? Well, if a patient is not on treatment and TBS increases, that, that, that's a very unlikely occurrence and could possibly be due to non-pharmacological uh, interventions. What about a treated patient with an increase in uh, TBS? Well, that's consistent uh, to a favorable uh, response with anabolic therapy. It may be observed in some patients in denosumab, but uh, less reliable than with anabolic therapy. And an increase is not expected with bisphosphonates uh, where the changes are small in TBS in comparison with BMD. Uh, this gives you uh, an approximate idea of uh, how TBS might change in proportion to changes in spine uh, BMD. And you see on the far uh, right, the, the largest changes in TBS and with BMD uh, occurring at 24 months with uh, the PTH anabolic agents uh, or romososumab. Uh, denosumab uh, may uh, see an increase in uh, TBS uh, that's a little smaller in proportion to the change in BMD. Uh, with bisphosphonates, probably little or none change to be expected with hormone replacement therapy, none. And you also see that with uh, placebo, uh, no change and uh, a decrease in BMD and TBS with glucocorticoids and aromatase inhibitor therapy. There is an association between TBS and type 2 diabetes where fracture risk uh, is out of proportion to BMD. And uh, it has been found that patients with prediabetes and type 2 diabetes have lower TBS than non-diabetic uh, matched individuals. And TBS appears as well to be related to diabetes control. TBS may be useful as a measurement for assessment of fracture risk in type 2 diabetics, and incorporating TBS into the FRAX calculation may improve our estimation of fracture risk in these patients. Uh, this is how we might think of uh, managing patients with osteoporosis when the uh, entry point is a, a bone density test. We certainly want to be sure that the DEXA and TBS images are good uh, quality. Uh, we then want to uh, use all the information we have available to assess fracture risk, and this includes uh, BMD, TBS, uh, assessment of vertebral fracture with spine imaging with uh, VFA or conventional uh, x-ray. Uh, we want to know what overall bone health is and consider clinical risk factors as well. Uh, the next question is, is fracture risk high enough that treatment is indicated? We also have to select which one uh, of the many choices for treatment we should initiate with and then determine uh, how long to treat, and we need to monitor patients to assure that they're achieving the expected benefit. Uh, garbage in and garbage out is a concept that uh, all of us are uh, used to with computers. It's the same with DEXA and TBS. We want to check for uh, appropriate edge detection by the software, uh, the presence of vertebral fracture or other artifacts, and be sure that the BMI is within the working range, which is uh, approximately uh, 15 to 37 to get uh, a valid TBS measurement. Uh, TBS uh, characterizes uh, bone structure and uh, the TBS values, which have no units, have been divided uh, into categories of normal, partially degraded, 
or degraded according to the cutoffs that you see here, uh, where the degraded classification, the, the lowest classification with the worst bone microarchitecture is TBS that's 1.230 or uh, below. Uh, it's illustrated in the graph above, and I, I find uh, that graph useful when I'm explaining the results uh, to patients, and they uh, do not want to be down in the red area if that can be helped. Uh, one way uh, to communicate this is to use analogies as well. Uh, some people have used uh, the analogy of uh, bone structure and scaffolding on a building. Uh, I often uh, tell patients that uh, two different bridges could be built out of exactly the same materials, but uh, if one is poorly constructed, uh, that bridge is more likely to fall down first when an earthquake uh, comes along. And that gives them a, another thing to think about when we're talking about bone microarchitecture. I, I think all of us have encountered uh, individuals who have had uh, osteoporotic fractures, but bone density is surprisingly normal. Uh, this was studied with the Manitoba DEXA database and over 7,000 women with fractures who had DEXA, BMD, and TBS. And it was found that about 10% of women with a fracture had normal uh, BMD at the hip and spine. However, about half of those with normal BMD at the hip and spine had abnormal uh, TBS in the degraded uh, category. And this tells us that if we look more carefully at bone health in women who appear to have normal bones, uh, many of them do not have normal bones after all. So what appears to be normal with DEXA BMD uh, may not be normal when the TBS is added. Uh, an interesting study of this same concept was uh, done in the Geelong osteoporosis study. It was found here uh, that of women with normal BMD, 12% had degraded TBS. Uh, of those with osteopenia, 26% uh, had degraded TBS. And with osteoporosis, 48% had degraded TBS. So I think the important concept here uh, is that there's a gradation of uh, TBS uh, in its relationship with BMD. You can be normal and have degraded TBS, and you can have osteoporosis and have normal uh, TBS. So this again uh, illustrates that this is an independent uh, risk factor for fracture that gives you information in addition to BMD. Uh, perhaps the most uh, useful clinical application of TBS is inclusion in the FRAX algorithm, uh, where uh, it may cause us to change our consideration of treatment. And here is an example where the addition of TBS uh, to the FRAX algorithm uh, caused the patient to cross the, the treatment threshold for US uh, according to 10-year uh, probability of hip fracture. And uh, in the European uh, system on the lower right-hand corner, uh, we have the concept uh, illustrated of uh, low risk, high risk, and very high risk. This is incorporated into current clinical practice guidelines. And uh, with the uh, inclusion of TBS, we may get a better estimation of which category a patient falls into. We may consider non-pharmacological therapy uh, when risk is low. Uh, we may consider bisphosphonates or donosumab when risk is high. And in the category of very high risk is where uh, we ought to think about the possibility of initiating therapy with an anabolic agent. So uh, again, uh, looking at these uh, risk uh, categories, uh, you can see in the graph at the top uh, where the patient falls and how that relates to the level uh, of risk. So I think there's a lot of uh, evidence uh, currently that the sequence of therapy is important. And in these very high risk patients, uh, anabolic therapy is appropriate. And it makes sense that when bone structure is poor, uh, 
when they get a degraded classification with TPS, that ideally you'd like to start with an agent that might improve bone microarchitecture and give patients better bone structure. So we have a few uh, clinical cases to present, and uh, I would like to turn this over to Andrea to present the case and give her thoughts on uh, what this describes to us. Thanks, Mike. Um, so as you can see, this is a 65-year-old woman who has a significant family history of osteoporosis and fracture. Uh, indeed, her mother had a history of four vertebral fractures beginning in her late 60s. The patient herself is generally healthy, really has no other clinical risk factors on overall risk assessment. But she has a bone density because she a, is age 65, but with this family history, wants to know what her risk is, does not want to end up like her mother, in her words. And you can see that her lowest T-score is a minus 1.8. So she falls into the low bone mass range. The rest of her physical is unrevealing, as is a workup for underlying secondary causes. When FRAX is performed, her 10-year risk of fracture by both MOF and hip fracture fall below the threshold, according to the current uh, US guidelines in terms of recommendations for treatment. Now, we all well know that clinical decision-making, uh, shared decision-making with the patient, deciding whether or not to initiate treatment at levels close to that threshold, certainly can be done. There are multiple factors that help us make a decision. But let's look at how incorporating TBS into the equation and fracture risk might influence that decision. So TBS is run, and she has a score of 1.155, which is in the degraded range. When FRAX is then adjusted for TBS, her 10-year risk of major osteoporotic fracture becomes 21% which is now above that threshold uh, based on you know, US clinical guidelines in terms of treatment and treatment would be indicated. Um, suffice it to say that that alone is not what makes that decision uh, in terms of where the patient sits, her desires, uh, but this is somebody who is very concerned given her family history and wants to be proactive in terms of management so that she can hopefully avoid the sequence uh, that her mother experienced in terms of multiple fractures. So it's an illustration where I think the additive effect or this independent um, piece of information with a degraded TBS can help in terms of clinical decision-making, you know, real patients that we see all the time. Mike, anything to add to that? Yeah, thanks, Andrea. Yeah, I see uh, TBS as an educational tool uh, for me and for the patient uh, with, who's with me in the room. Uh, it gives us both more information about the level of fracture risk. It's, it's not the final answer in making treatment decisions, but uh, I always feel that if I have more information and the patient has more information, we can uh, together uh, come up with uh, a plan that's medically reasonable and acceptable to the patient at the same time. So I, I think it gives us useful information in cases such as this. So let's go on to case number two. Uh, this is the uh, flip side of this. This is a 56-year-old woman uh, with an osteoporotic T-score at the femoral neck, uh, no other clinical risk factors. VFA is normal. Uh, TBS is normal, and uh, FRAX uh, is uh, low. So here a patient has osteoporosis according to T-score, uh, and yet uh, fracture risk is low. So in this situation, again, it's, uh, I think it's an educational tool having a conversation with the patient. Uh, I explained to the patient that uh, even though you have a diagnosis of osteoporosis, I'm not terribly worried about your bones crumbling in the near future. And uh, if you choose non-pharmacological therapy, that might be okay. And some people will jump at that opportunity to avoid taking drugs. And other patients who are equally reasonable say, I already have osteoporosis. I don't want to wait for it to get worse. Uh, I'd rather get started on treatment now. So uh, again, it just provides us both with more information to have a more intelligent conversation about how to manage the situation. 
So what do you think, Andrea? Well, I think these are patients that we see all of the time. You know, young women whose T scores uh, are not where we would like them to be, but when we really assess risk and certainly imminent risk, as you've mentioned, that risk is potentially low in the near term. Um, and I think the TBS sort of adds to, to that uh, overall risk assessment. So as you said, for somebody who doesn't want to be treated, we may be a little bit more comfortable than if we were solely looking at T-scores. Um, it might also, if somebody did want to be treated, help us choose where we start in terms of management and the type of therapy, uh, since TBS is, is normal. Um, and certainly, you know, I think our approach for that younger woman has, in some respects, maybe even come full circle in terms of thinking about using estrogen in those who can take it or raloxifene uh, in somebody who is primarily low, fine bone mineral density. As you mentioned, it's an added piece of information. It helps in terms of counseling and giving someone an overall picture of their current status. So I agree with your thoughts. Sustained a T12 vertebral fracture with you know, minimal movement, lifting a window blind. She appropriately gets a bone mineral density study uh, by DEXA, and her scores at both the spine and the total hip are normal. Uh, as you can see, she had a prior DEXA, presumably around the time of menopause. Um, there has been a significant decline in terms of bone mineral density at both the spine and the total hip, but her scores remain within the normal range. And this can often be a conundrum. We've talked about the patient who has normal bone density, but has had a classic osteoporotic fracture, which by almost all of our guidelines would give a clinical diagnosis of osteoporosis. But patients sometimes have a difficult time getting their head around the fact that bone density is normal, and yet we tell them they have osteoporosis and may indeed recommend treatment. Here, TBS is degraded. And again, as Mike mentioned, just looking at the images and where that dot falls into the red category, maybe an aha moment or an additional piece of information uh, that helps us in terms of education. Thinking back to that Nora graph we looked at earlier, we know that there's no bone density that renders someone safe from having an osteoporotic fracture, and about 10% of patients with fractures do indeed have normal bone mineral density. So I think where we all feel inclined to want to treat when somebody has a spine or hip fracture, certainly knowing that TBS is degraded uh, may push us more in that direction and help us educate the patient in terms of why treatment may be needed. Mike, other thoughts? Yeah, thanks, Andrea. Uh, well, these sorts of cases are head scratchers and uh, I, I never know what to do. Uh, but this certainly gives us more information. It's, uh, uh, we want to do something to prevent more vertebral fractures, but of course there's no clinical trial evidence that says we can reduce uh, fractures uh, by pharmacological therapy in patients with normal bone density, but certainly uh, a consideration. So uh, let's go on to some other information uh, about uh, TBS, and I'm going to turn it over to Shelley Horn, who's going to tell us about the new report forms uh, and uh, reimbursement issues uh, regarding TBS in the U.S. Great. Uh, thank you, Dr. Luecki um, and Dr. Singer. Some really, really good information uh, there um, and, and clinical cases as well. Um, just, just quickly, uh, a couple of uh, important information. Um, the, the new report uh, that we have come out with for, for TBS um, provides some additional benefits. Um, in addition to providing, obviously, the trabecular bone score uh, value, uh, it actually it takes the information from the BMD and TBS and combines them in sort of a skeletal assessment, um, looking at it from the standpoint of bone resilience um, to kind of help provide a better understanding of how to combine the BMD value T-score along with TBS. Um, it also provides the information about the uh, FRAX adjusted with TBS, but also the new feature, which is the BMD T-score adjusted with TBS. Um, so it kind of provides two different uh, ways of uh, looking at uh, therapeutic decision tools um, with TBS uh, used as an additive factor, uh, as you guys have been uh, discussing. Uh, and, and finally, uh, the second page provides some 
um, conclusions, some automatic conclusions to help with the interpretation of TBS um, and the different parameters uh, together. It's something that can be edited, um, but at least it helps, you know, from a reporting standpoint, some additional information. Um, and for those um, uh, regions um, and countries that uh, have specific guidelines with regards to the uh, FRAX curve um, in looking at the uh, population, we've actually added an editable FRAX curve. So you can put into your, your um, report the, the regional data uh, for your population and see where your patients um, end up on that, that curve. Um, with regards to TMB, uh, reimbursement, um, just I think that uh, it's not new news, but it's important uh, to be able to share with you guys it, uh, that um, hopefully this is something that will make uh, TBS more accessible um, to the patient populations and the physicians who are treating um, osteoporotic patients um, or determining whether or not they need to be treated. Uh, CMS has released uh, reimbursement uh, for TBS. There are actually four independent uh, CPT codes for TBS that are actually independent of uh, the DEXA codes. Um, and currently, I know this question has come up with for me uh, several times, which is it currently um, aside with the multiple procedure uh, rule, and it does not, it does not apply um, at this point in time. Um, but as we know with CMS, it'll kind of be a wait and see uh, to see kind of how things go over the next year. Um, with regards specifically uh, to the codes, um, on the next slide, um, it sort of describes specifically what those codes are. Um, I have the top one, 77089, highlighted because that's the one that will be used in 99% of uh, clinical practice. Um, that's the one that includes the uh, actual technical components of the analysis, the scanning, um, the data interpretation, um, and the report and um, clinician interpretation. So the uh, 77089 currently based on CMS's RVU schedule um, would be equate to uh, on average the 4153. Um, the other components were designed more so uh, if you have uh, interpretation being done in a different facility, but the scanning is being done somewhere else, but that's a very rare circumstances. So the most important one is to understand the 77089 code. Um, additionally, uh, as with uh, ADEXA, there's also the um, outpatient, the, out, the ops um, physician's uh, fee schedule. And that really is for the hospital-based. Um, and that looks at more of the technical component, which is the 77090 and the 77091, um, which uh, similar to DEXA has a slightly higher reimbursement amount about you know, on average 82.61. Um, so, you know, so uh, I'm going to turn it back over to Dr. Lewicki for a summary, um, and then we'll have an opportunity for some uh, questions and answers. Thank you, Shelley. I just want to quickly review the, the benefits of TBS, and that is that uh, there are robust uh, data supporting adjustment of FRAX. It can be a tiebreaker in borderline clinical decision making. Uh, assessment of bone health in patients who fracture with normal BMD or, or who have soft bones with orthopedic surgery. It's a patient education school. Uh, it may be useful in monitoring some patients that's FDA cleared and it's reimbursed by Medicare. Limitations include the fact that the software must be purchased. Uh, we can't use it to diagnose osteoporosis. It's one of many uh, decision points to consider and precision assessment must be done in order to calculate uh, LSC, and it's not reimbursed uh, by all insurance. So thank you for your uh, attention, and uh, I look uh, forward to the question and answer session. And thank you, uh, Andrea and Shelley, for participating in this. Okay, so good evening, all of you. I guess we can have um, Mike, Andre, and Shelley. So I'm uh, Professor Didier Hans, and I will be uh, sharing uh, this uh, Q&A session, moderating the Q&A session. Uh, so we have about six, seven questions been coming here, so we have very little time, but let's try to go quick through it. 
One of the first question was related to whether or not if there is four vertebrates that it excluded for some reason, whether or not we can still use TVS. So who wants to take that one, Mike, Andre? I'll go ahead, I'll go ahead with this. And, and most of what I've learned about TBS is from DDA in the first place. So uh, <laughs> um, what, what I understand from what, what he's told me yeah. and, and from the data that we have in studies is that uh, um, when we're excluding vertebral bodies because of degenerative arthritis, so those uh, might be included in the TBS calculation and seem to have very little influence on the TBS measurement. Uh, however, if you're excluding vertebral bodies for reasons such as uh, uh, hardware or uh, vertebral uh, augmentation or perhaps very uh, severe scoliosis, I don't really know about that, but that would make me nervous using the TBS, but then, then you probably would exclude those particular vertebral bodies. Well, thank you. Uh, uh, one of the study is mostly an anecdote reported by Curtis about the fact that uh, the TBS doesn't always improve with the PTH uh, and biomedical markers or something like that. Uh, so I don't know if someone wants to answer this. I'll take a brief, it. yeah, I'll take a brief stab at it and then Mike and Didier, you can comment as well. I, there have been many studies now that have demonstrated that more than roughly half of patients who are treated with anabolics actually will increase TBS in sort of their underlying structure. Um, most of the rest will be maintained, so you may not see an increase, but should see stability. There's a small proportion that may decrease. Um, and obviously, we're measuring different things when we're looking at TBS versus bone density, so it's important to take both of those things into consideration. There's a more recent study that was done that actually demonstrated that the increase in TBS with anabolic treatment coincided or was associated with reduction in vertebral fracture. So, you know, nothing is 100%, um, but generally we do see at least stability or improvement. Yeah, just to follow up on that, there's at least three ways we can follow uh, anabolic therapy, and that's with uh, bone density testing, uh, with TBS, and with bone turnover markers. And uh, I'm not sure that any one of those is perfect. Uh, and perhaps uh, of all of those, uh, measuring a bone turnover marker, like such as a P1NP early on in the course of uh, anabolic therapy, may actually be the, uh, the quickest and perhaps the best way to monitor therapy. Thank you. So I think another question was related from uh, Fong Chun uh, mentioning that sometimes you have uh, elderly people with a degraded uh, uh, low density, but the structure is uh, uh, close to normal, at least when they refer to a TBS T-score. Well, clearly I will not use a T-score, so to speak. I will use the threshold we provided through the presentation. T-score, there is no threshold to be used for normal and not normal. Uh, but the question is, uh, what should we tell to a referring physician for treatment plan? If we have uh, also osteopenic in that case and normal uh, TBS. So, well, Mike, maybe I'll throw it back to you because you showed some of that data with the uh, Geelong study and the Manitoba data in terms of the fact that there are variations, right? That they don't always go hand in hand. So if you want to comment on that. Yeah, you, you know, if TBS always correlated with bone density, there would be no need for TBS in the first place. <laughs> so the the value of TBS is that it's an independent uh, predictor of fracture risk. So uh, there, there may be as, as many as you know, around 20% of patients with osteoporosis who have normal uh, TBS, and there'll be some patient with normal BMD that have degraded uh, TBS. So that actually is to be expected and that's a, a, a valuable uh, characteristic of TPS and exactly the reason we use it in the first place. Okay, quick question from Larry Jansky. How sensitive TBS is a resolution to an MRI image? Is array mode a logic prefer over express mode? Or, or, uh, maybe I will take that one, it's a bit technical. So uh, uh, Larry, 
uh, the TBS algorithm, well, the basic is the same. It's been optimized for a given image resolution, given noise in the image, acquisition mode, and so on. So that means uh, we take that into account with the optimized clinical outcome. Uh, the fact that the express mode, the quality of the image of the express mode, meaning an extrapolation is very fast, so it extrapolates a bit too much, uh, give an insufficient level of quality of the image, and that's why the express mode, for example, is not supported by the TBS insight. Uh, so I hope I did answer the uh, question for, for, for you, Larry. Uh, another question I was not entirely sure what denotes low, high, and very high frax risk. Uh, from Cathy Sowers, I'm not quite, um, I'm not quite sure what it means here in the context well, did, of did, Didier, uh, I, I think our, our time has come to a close, but but let me tell you what I like best very quickly about that. Uh, the Canadian system, I believe, looks at major osteoporotic fracture and considers um, between 10 and 20 percent tenure mm -hmm. probability, moderate risk, you know, 20 mm -hmm. or over high risk and below uh, 10 low risk. So that's that's one way of thinking about it. But uh, I, there's other ways as well. Yeah. And when you do that with the TBS adjusted, uh, the frags adjusted by TBS, you still use a high, low and price. You just moderate or weight on the frags probability as we all do. Uh, I think we, we're coming to uh, an end. So if there is more question, we can have a follow up through a script, I guess. Uh, I think it's time for me to thank you all uh, for uh, this uh, nice session. Clearly, it's not the same that being alive a mode and exchanging, uh, maybe after with a glass of wine. Uh, I mean that, um, <laughs> but hopefully soon. <laughs> Uh, so I'm uh, really crossing the finger that the coming conference or at least ICD next year will be alive and that will be more fun to exchange or debate around uh, the added value of TBS in different uh, uh, situations and so on or any other topic you'd like. So I think take that. Thank you very much, all of you. Uh, have a good evening, morning or night or, or afternoon, uh, depending where you are. Uh, it's getting late for me, but uh, I think thank you all. Thank you. Thank you, guys.